time to talk about fundamentals of vector spaces. Under this, under this broad title, I'm going to look at five, three or four uh, sub areas. First of all, we'll define formally what is a vector space. Then we move to non-linear spaces. And also what are called as Banach spaces. <laughs> then uh, we have inner product spaces. And we'll also touch upon Hilbert spaces. So these are named after some of the famous mathematicians. And then we look at the uh, Gram Schmidt process in the end. Gram Schmidt optimization. So these are the four sub areas which I intend to cover. Now, Gram Schmidt process as applied to uh, any general vector space. Now, what is a vector space? What uh, what do we know about vector spaces? When we start thinking about vector spaces, from what background we have, from uh, background that we have from undergraduate, we uh, either look at well, we normally imagine a vector in a three-dimensional space. So this is a vector, say x, or let's call this vector v. It has three components, x, y, and z. And this is how we normally imagine a vector space. Now what is done in functional analysis is to distill essential properties of this vector space and then come up with a new definition called vector space which is more generic, which can be applied to any set of objects, any set of objects that are relevant to us when we do uh, computational or uh, analytical mathematics. Now actually, the other course that we are doing, in that also in the beginning there will be some uh, introduction to these vector spaces. So now what is it? What is it that we what is it that we uh, need to generalize, and why we need to generalize? First of all, we can look at this vector space or set of all vectors in this vector space, it's an infinite set, okay, as a set on which certain operations can be done, okay. Uh, what are these operations? <laughs> Addition, you can add two vectors and get a vector. The nice thing is that you get a vector in the same space. And you can multiply a vector by a scalar and you get another vector in the same space. So, these are the two generic properties of any two vectors in the space and I could use this to uh, generalize, define a generalized notion of a vector space. It is not enough to just generalize this notion of a vector space. We also need something more uh, to work with vector spaces. We need to know about the length of a vector because that's a critical thing that we use when we uh, actually work with vectors in three dimensions. So we need to have a generalization of that which is called a norm of a vector. We will talk about norms of a vector. It's not enough to just talk about norm. We have notions of a sequence in one dimension. So a sequence which is converging to a number to a something called limit. So what is the limit in n dimensions or in three dimensions? So we need to actually generalize the concept of convergence and limit. Uh, then there are some funny things that happen when you start working with higher dimensional spaces. And that's where we had, I had mentioned is one x spaces and inverse spaces. So these are some special category of spaces which, are, which we are going to look at. Now, uh, it's not enough just to work with norm and convergence. We need something more. 
what is what else you use in three dimensions what is the important geometric concept that you need a coordinate well not coordinate coordinate is of course when you define the space many times a coordinate system will come with it it's not a coordinate it's angle angle between two vectors it's a very very important concept well we uh, in three dimensions everything come together package we don't really think of these things separately but uh, when you generalize this concept to any other space, we need to make efforts to define what is angle between two vectors. And uh, also, one of the most important concepts that you use in three dimensions is orthogonal vectors, 90 degrees, two vectors, and then, well, of course, uh, the Pythagoras theorem, which is used in many, many ways. So. What we are going to look at initially is, is it possible to generalize these concepts and develop some notions of uh, vector spaces on generic sets which are useful in mathematical analysis. Why, why am I doing all this in the beginning of a course which is supposed to be computational methods and uh, you would be starting with development of recipes. Well, if you understand these grand generalizations which were probably done in the beginning of 19th century, uh, beginning of 20th century, uh, then it becomes very easy to understand the foundations of different numerical methods that we are going to study. So this six or seven lectures which might look disconnected in the beginning are actually deeply connected with what we are going to do later. Okay. So this forms the foundation. and. You will understand basis of many many methods if you understand uh, these concepts of vector spaces, orthogonality, and so on. Many of these things are unknowingly used when you do your undergraduate courses without uh, you know being given uh, a thorough explanation. Here we'll lay a systematic foundation of vector spaces. Now let's well uh, soon I'm going to talk about you know. Uh, four dimensional, five dimensional, n dimensional spaces, and then uh, I'll also move to something called infinite dimensional spaces. And well, it's not possible to visualize. In fact, it's not possible to visualize anything beyond three dimensions. You cannot visualize a four dimensional space and a five dimensional space, and obviously not an infinite dimensional space. So there's a word of caution before we move into this: is that it's enough to know your geometry, school geometry. Well, it's enough to know your undergraduate. Uh, three-dimensional world well. If you understand the concepts in undergraduate three-dimensional world uh, or your school geometry, it's you will understand everything that I am doing. Okay. It's only, uh, it's only a matter of uh, generalizing these concepts. Same concept which I have been using right since our 8th standard, we are going to generalize them into uh, something very, very elegant. Um, so now let's begin with um, Let's begin with the concept of closure, a closure of uh, of a particular set for an operation uh, is defined as if you take any two elements from the set, let x be a set, let x is a set, and uh, there are any two elements, say um, x and y, belong to belong to set X, okay? Then X operation Y also belongs to the set X. Now this operation here I have written as plus, it could be any operation, it could be multiplication, it could be division, okay? So given any set, if you take any two elements of this set and if you perform an operation, for example, multiplication. Okay, and if uh, the element that results after performing the operation also belongs to the set, then it is called a closed set. Okay. For example, set of integers is closed on addition. It's not closed on division. Right. The next concept that is important is a field. What is a field? Uh, 
and division. Correct. So field is a set of elements closed under So well, the well known examples of field are set of real numbers, set of complex numbers and these are the two fields which are they are going to use. So, so we are going to denote these as R, R will denote the set of real numbers and C will denote the set of complex numbers. That is closed under two operations. A vector space is a set of objects. It is closed under addition, so if I take any any element x and y belonging to x, then x plus y also belongs to x. Well, it is not enough to have just a set of objects, we need something more to define a vector space. We also need a field. For example, a field could be R, so we, let's call the field as F. So we need two things here, a set of objects X and a field F. If I take any scalar alpha from F and any X belonging to X, then alpha times X, this is called a scalar multiplication, this also belongs to X. So a vector space, a concept which is generalization of three dimensional vector space is nothing but nothing but a set of objects which actually satisfy these two operations or a set which is closed under these two operations given the field F. Okay, it depends upon the combination. So these X and F, they are a combination. You cannot separate them. You have to consider them together. Well, let me start generalizing and giving you examples of spaces which are... My first example is going to be uh, X corresponds to Rn and F corresponds to R. What is Rn? Rn is n double, okay, a vector which has n components. So, a general vector here, x that belongs to x will be represented as, it has n components, x1, x2, xn, okay, it may have n components, can you give me an example where you need such a thing? Let's say I am dealing with a, I am dealing with some chemical reactor and I decide to associate a vector space that defines different variables. Uh, so here x1, x2 to xn could consist of for example x1 could be temperature in the reactor, x2 could be pressure and x3 to xn could be different chemical species that are present inside the reactor. So this is this is, this is is a vector that represents the state inside the reactor or let me take a distillation column. A distillation column will have uh, different trays and on each tray you have temperature pressure composition, right? So if there are 20 trays and it's a binary distillation column, how many how many variables do you expect to have? 20 temperatures, 20 pressures actually, pressure will be varying across the column, then compositions, about 60, well, you can, uh, there are correlations between y and x, so, uh, there would be 80 elements in a vector or 60 elements in the vector that defines uh, all the variables that are associated with the distillation column which has 20 ways to define a distillation column and so on. So I can, I can think of examples from chemical engineering which would actually have uh, a way you deal with vectors that are higher dimensional vectors. <coughs> but an example that would tell you uh, 
what is which combination will not be a vector space. See, for example, if I take x to be R n and f to be c, set of complex numbers, will this form a vector space? Why? The scalar multiplication will break down. If I take a scalar which is complex multiplied to a vector which is real valued, I will not get an element from x. So this is not a vector space. Well, my next example is my next example is a uh, little unconventional. So now I'm going to move to set of real valued matrices. So this is my x. This corresponds to my x. Okay, and my f is still set of real numbers. Set of real valued matrices. Does this form a vector space? Yes, it does. Why? The additional two matrices will be. If you take any two n cross n matrices, if you add them, you still get an n cross n matrix. If you take a scalar and multiply it to an n cross n matrix, you still get an n cross n matrix. Okay? So if I take any two matrices, say A and B, which belong to F, then I can say that any alpha times A plus beta times B belongs to also X. Uh, sorry, this is X here and alpha, beta belong to F. So for any matrix X, for any matrix A and any matrix B, which are both N cross N, uh, so these are elements, these are vectors in this space, vector space. If I take uh, a scalar multiplication of A and a scalar multiplication of B, then this, this sum should also belong to this space, which is true for any N cross N, any N cross N vector. Okay. So, and my fourth example is something that we are going to use quite often in this course. So my example number four is... This is denoted as CAB. So CAB is set of continuous functions. Set of real valued continuous functions. Set of all real valued continuous functions on interval AB. So if I have a function say FT which and a function gt, both of which belong to x, then, and if I take any, if I take any two scalars, say alpha and beta, that belong to f, then alpha times ft plus beta times g of t also belongs to x. Set of real value continuous. Have you come across this kind of functions? Where? Where did you study these kind of functions? Fourier series? Not Taylor series. Taylor series is not Fourier series. <coughs> what happens in Fourier series? You talk about you talk about functions on minus pi to pi or zero to two pi. Remember something? Rings a bell? A and B and are two constants. Yeah, we're going to look at Fourier series much more in detail in the next few lectures. Okay, so. Do you agree with me? If I take a continuous function, if I take a continuous function and multiply it by a scalar, will it still be a continuous function? Will it still be a continuous function, right? If I add to a continuous function, will the addition be continuous? If f of t is continuous and g of t is continuous, adding two continuous functions, I still get a continuous function. So scalar multiplication, vector addition, both properties hold in this abstract set, it's difficult to visualize how this set looks like, you know, we are used to visualizing in three dimensions, nevertheless, the properties that hold, the fundamental properties that hold in three dimensions also hold in this set, that's very, very important, okay, so, if you have a vector, if you have a vector which belongs to this set, 
multiply it by a scalar, you get a vector in the same set. Very important. And if you have a vector which is <coughs> well, this is not enough to just define vector spaces. We also have to talk about subspace. So very very important concept in three dimensions. What is the subspace in three dimensions? What are the subspaces that will go in three dimensions? Line passing through the origin, yeah, correct. Then is the only subset? A plane. So will a plane not passing through origin? Will it be a subspace? Why? Why? Good. Why is your argument? Where does it come from? So let's define what is a subspace. So I want to define a subspace. So this is, I have set of vector x and field f and then let m be subset of x, m is some subset of x, a non-empty subset of x and if I take any two elements in m, so x and y, they belong to m and alpha, beta belong to f then alpha x plus beta y should belong to m. The way we define subspace is a non-empty subset, a non-empty subset of original space x, okay, like example that he gave just now, a line passing through origin or a plane passing through origin, okay, but why was origin important? That, that origin is required in this space is hidden in this definition. Can you dig out? Any, the word is that, you know, the main thing is any alpha beta belonging to f. So what about 0, 0? If I choose, if I choose, if I choose alpha to be equal to 0 and beta to be equal to 0, then 0 times any vector plus 0 times any vector will give me 0 vector. 0 vector should be contained in the space. Okay, so if I have a subspace, then it follows from this definition that the zero vector, the origin should be contained in the space. So only those sets, only those sets which contain the origin qualify to be subspaces. Okay, now, now let's understand this little more. If I take, okay, let me, let me try to draw a subspace. Uh, Imagine that uh, this, this square, the plane which passes through this, this is a plane that passes through the origin. Okay, now there are two situations, two scenarios. One is, this is a finite, this is a finite set, it's only like a, like a piece of paper, okay, just look at this piece of paper which is passing through the origin, it is finite size, it is passing through the origin, will it form a subspace? Just because it passes through origin, will it form a subspace? Yes. What will fail? It should also have x plus y belonging to x, the closure rule. I can take two elements, this is passing through the origin, I can take two elements such that x plus y belongs to But not for all x plus y. Correct. The word all is important. It should happen for every x plus y, okay, it may happen that if I take a finite set like this and not the infinite set, it may happen that for two, two vectors, say this vector and this vector, the addition may not belong to this, this small set. Yeah. Excuse me, why are we talking about 0 only for subspace? Isn't the same true even for the vector space? Of course. So why is it? Uh... But vector spaces, origin is included, is obvious. The subspace is a subspace is a small set. Subspace is a smaller set. So does every smaller set qualify to be a subspace? Is the question that I'm asking. Okay. So what is, for example, what is zero element in in this in this? What is zero element here? Yeah, constant function zero. F t equal to zero over interval a to b. Okay. Here it's important to remember that t belongs to a comma b. A comma. Well, we, we get, do we get this kind of functions in chemical engineering? Do 
think of temperature profile in the heat exchanger. Okay, my A would be my A would be zero to one, when it will not be time. T don't associate T with time; it could be space. So Z is my spatial variable. Okay, varies from zero to T. Okay, and I can look at the temperature profile inside a distillation in, inside a, a heat exchanger. As a is it a continuous function? Yes. It's a continuous function. It's a continuous function. So this kind of these kind of vectors, these kind of vector spaces are very very commonly encountered in chemical engineering examples. And of course, the zero, the zero element would be well, not zero temperature. We often talk about perturbations and a steady state. If you have a steady state and a perturbation, the perturbation vector is zero, which means you are at steady state. So you may have, uh, you you will not have in, in the in the case of uh, a heat exchanger example, the zero element technically would be uh, everywhere you have zero temperature. Uh, such a heat exchanger doesn't exist, but uh, the space in the space you can of course define a zero vector, which is so. So coming back to this subspaces, every subset doesn't qualify to be a subspace. Okay, this thing is important. If I take alpha any scalar alpha, multiply it by uh, multiply it by vector, then the resulting vector also should be included inside the space. So if I take this vector and if I multiply it by a large scalar, the new vector might be here, which is not included in this small finite set. This is not a subspace. So just going through origin is not sufficient. Okay, you need to have closure. You need to have closure of this operation alpha times x for any alpha plus beta times y. This sum should be belonging to. So can you can I give you an example? I'll just I'll just give you an example which is uh, completely different. But generalize this concept. Let's look at our. Let's look at this space. Okay. Set of polynomials. Set of polynomials. Are they continuous functions? Yes. Right. Set of polynomials is a continuous function. Okay. Set of polynomials. Let's say de defined over a to b or zero to one. If you want to, if it's convenient for you to imagine zero to one. So set of polynomials defined over zero to one. What will be the set? What will be that set? So let me take this set. Let me take this set S. Uh, we call it M here. Let me take this set M, which is uh, one t t square up to t to the power n. Okay. Will this combination be also a polynomial? This is an unordered polynomial. Okay, this is an unordered polynomial. Now, when I'm visualizing each one of them as an unordered polynomial with uh, some coefficient zero. Okay, so this this particular this particular this particular set set of all possible uh, polynomials with any alpha one to alpha uh, alpha n from the field. This particular set will form a subspace of this vector space. Because these are continuous functions, these are continuous functions, and then if you take a polynomial, if you take a polynomial, a finite order polynomial, add to it another polynomial, you're going to get a finite order polynomial. Okay, so so all those properties, all these properties will hold for set of polynomials, and then you can show that this is a subspace. Zero element will be there, zero function, zero polynomial. Okay, so all the all the things that you need will be there in, in this set. Okay, I'll give you another example of subspace. Uh, can you think of a subspace for n cross n matrices? For example, let's take my set here. So you understand this if you understand these examples, because just writing this definition is too abstract. Unless you associate with some real examples, it's not possible to understand. These concepts. So let my x be set of, and of course my field is my field is R. Okay, I'm going to define 
a subset M, which is a subset of X, which is a non-empty subset of X. Now M here, set of all symmetric matrices. Is it a subspace? What is a subspace? If I take a scalar alpha, see, when you call the matrix to be symmetric, A transpose is equal to A. Okay? Just test this. You know, will alpha times A transpose, will it be equal to alpha times A? For any alpha. Right? For any alpha, by the way, what is the zero element in this space? What is the zero vector? Null matrix. Null matrix. So if, if I set alpha to be zero, it's a symmetric matrix, right? It belongs to this subspace. What about alpha? If I take any two matrices A and B belonging to this subset M, okay, will their linear combination Will their linear combination also belong to M? Yeah. If this is symmetric and if this B is symmetric, will this addition also be symmetric? It's a symmetric matrix. So this subspace or the subset defined by this defined by this uh, is a you know is a set which is which forms a subspace. Not every every set will form a subspace, but uh, this particular set of set of symmetric matrices will form. Likewise, if you go to a set of complex value matrices with a field to be complex numbers, you can define with Hermitian matrices. Set of all Hermitian matrices, okay, will be uh, a subspace of the set of complex value matrices. Okay, so these are the Generic example, what is the next thing that you need when you when you start looking at vector spaces? What is the thing that you use most? Well, one of the one of the most important concepts that you use is basis and dimension. What is dimension of a vector space? <coughs> ah, you see. No, not coordinates. What is dimension? How do you define dimension? This is the common misconception. Number of coordinates. Okay. Let's look at this subspace. This is my this is a line passing through the origin, and all of us agree that this is a subspace. Okay? It's a line passing through the origin. Any vector on this any vector on this line will be represented by three components. Does it mean it's it's a three-dimensional subspace? What is the dimension? One. Why? Because it's all independent. Number of independent vectors are only one. So just because a vector has n components doesn't mean that doesn't mean that you know the dimension of the vector of the vector space or the subspace is one. The dimension of this subspace is only one, okay? And there's only one independent direction. Let's say, let's say you call this some vector x. So any vector, any uh, let's call this vector b. So any vector on this line will be alpha times b, okay? If alpha is minus, it will go in this direction. If alpha is plus, it will go in this direction. So but it's basically alpha times b. So there's only one independent direction, okay? So likewise, a plane cutting, a plane passing through the origin, what is the dimension of the space? Two, because there are only two independent vectors. Two independent vectors can generate the entire space, linear combination of two independent vectors. In that. So we need to now generalize this concept of dimension and Well, to generalize this concept, we need to generalize many other concepts. We have to uh, we have to have notion of linear combination defined. After that, uh, 
we will have to define what is called as a basis set and then move on to now you should go through the notes i have given many more examples of vector spaces so uh, i'm not as i said i'm not going to write everything onto the board you should look at the notes now if i am given a vector now i have to introduce one important uh, notation here because we are going to work with set of vectors and uh, each vector might be n tuple okay each vector might be n tuple so uh, i have to so i have to introduce a new notation now i'm going to consider a set here a set x i where x i have some i have some space x here and this x i these are vectors that belong to this set x where i goes from 1 to n okay it is quite possible that my set is nothing but r m so m tuples okay so an element here there are n vectors and each one of them is a m tuple okay so way i am going to define this is x i it corresponds to x i 1 x i 2 x i m so this notation is is central to this notation is central to our course i'm going to use it very very often that you have a sector so superscript in in brackets uh is used to indicate ith vector okay and a subscript is used to indicate the component of the ith vector okay so x i2 is second component of ith vector and so so we'll be using this this notation very very often now if i choose any set of scalars if i choose any set of scalars say alpha 1 alpha 2 alpha n okay then a vector which is defined by alpha 1 x1 plus alpha 2 x2 this vector is called as linear combination of this vector is called linear combination of the set of vectors this is a set of vectors belonging to space x okay alpha 1 to alpha n are some scalars arbitrary scalars belonging to the field f and then the vector that you get by uh alpha 1 times x1 plus alpha 2 times x2 up to alpha n times xn this particular vector obviously uh we are dealing with a vector space so uh, or we are dealing with a subset in which um this linear combination if, if you if you talk about a subset alone uh then it's a finite set and if we take all possible linear combinations of this this these vectors they give a special subset that is called a span If I take a vector, yeah. I'm sorry, you didn't understand the notation, sir. Sir, uh, can you view them as matrices, sir? No, no. These are not. Sorry. This is a vector. This is ith vector. Okay. This is ith vector. See, for example, I may have two vectors. Let me take a five-dimensional space. So I have vector one. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, and vector two. which is 5 4 3 2 1 1 1 okay now how do i refer to third element of vector 2 so i will say v 2 3 that is equal to okay vector 2 third element okay similarly v 2 5 will be one so this is not a subscript no no this is just a notation just a notation that which we are going to use very very often whenever you have subscript in brackets 
a superscript in brackets, it implies that uh, it's a ith vector. Okay, and if I want to if I want to refer to the zth component of ith vector, okay, then I will use x i z. It's not a matrix. It's a notation. Now these kind of things do appear in, in, in numerical methods in computations because we do iterative procedures. Okay, you start from one vector and then you get another vector and then you get another vector. Okay, so you have a sequence of vectors and that's where you need to know this, have this a little complex notation. So sometimes we develop algorithms in which we need to worry about this uh, superscript and then this subscript together. Okay, that's why we need to have this notation. Okay, so this span is set of all possible combinations. You understand? Set of all possible combinations. If I give you two vectors in three dimensions, if I give you two vectors, in, okay. Uh, First, start with two dimensions. If I give you any two vectors, let's call them V1 and V2. Are these two vectors in two dimensions? What is this set? So, span, span of V1, V2. This corresponds to alpha v1 plus beta v2 for any alpha beta that belong to f. Okay? That belong to the field f. What is this set? Field f here is real numbers. What is this set? It's a plane passing through origin. Okay? Because two independent vectors, two linearly independent vectors, we have to define what is linear independence. So, two linearly independent vectors. If I take all possible linear combination, then what I get is the span, and the span is nothing but yeah. Well, let's say that this is a subspace. This is the subspace. If I give you a third vector in the same subspace, okay, which is V3. Okay, what will be alpha v1 plus beta v2 plus gamma v3? Same thing. Okay, that is because this third vector v3 is linearly dependent upon v1 and v2. And then you can, then you, what, you, what you get here. So, if I have some more vectors belonging to the same set here, okay, same subspace, and if I take all possible linear combinations, I am not going to get a different set. I am not going to get a different set. Okay. I will get the same set, which is this plane. I cannot leave this plane. If I take a linear combination of any two vectors in this plane, I cannot leave this plane. What is the minimum number of vectors that are required to generate this plane? Two. Okay. So, the minimum number of vectors that are required to generate a subspace or a space is called as the dimension of the vector space. Okay. What is dimension of this particular subspace? This is a subspace, right? This span is a subspace. What is the dimension? Dimension is 2 because you need only two, two linearly independent vectors. You need only two linearly independent vectors to generate all vectors inside this plane which is passing through the origin. Okay. This is a two dimensional subspace of three dimensions. This is a two dimensional subspace of everyone with me on this? Okay. Now, let's consider these two vectors. What will be span of these two vectors? It gives eight times. Correct. What dimensional plane in R5? Two. Two dimensional plane in R5. Okay. If I take span of V1, V2, it is alpha times 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 plus beta times 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. For any alpha beta,
for alpha, beta belongs to R. This all possible linear combinations of these two vectors is called a span of is called a span of these two vectors, and this span will be nothing but a two-dimensional subspace, a two-dimensional subspace of R phi. What is R phi? Phi double a space consisting of vectors. Each vector has phi doubles. It has phi components. So number of components in a vector doesn't define the dimension. Okay. This is a fifth phi dimensional double. Just because it has phi components doesn't mean this linear combination will define. If I take only one vector, say v1, what will be alpha times v1? A straight line. Right. It's a line and it's one dimensional subspace. It's a one dimensional subspace of R5, five dimensional space. Okay? It will be one dimensional subspace of R5. Well, uh, so far so good. We'll probably define what is basis. And uh, move on to some more, some more insights into why this is all required. Where do I need this? We do our next lecture.